start off uh, this evening, we want to express our sincere Christian sympathy uh, to Jacqueline, Beverly, Elaine, and Sonia, and of course our brother Derek Muir at the passing of Jacqueline's father. Uh, the funeral service is going to be a private uh, service from the home on Saturday, so do please remember the family circle at this time, please. Now we're going to sing our opening hymn this evening, What Can Wash Away My Sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Someone will remain seated after the introduction as we worship again, please. <laughs> But the blood of Jesus, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Father, we do indeed thank Thee for another opportunity to be found 
in this thy house. We thank thee, Father, for this midweek prayer meeting and Bible study. We thank thee, Father, for the ability and the opportunity for thy people to come uh, united in Christ and to meet around thy precious word to uh, learn the great truths of Scripture and then later in thy will to come and to approach thee at the throne of grace in prayer. Father, surely this is a great privilege for thy people tonight. Surely this is our great joy to be able to come and to have fellowship with thee. And Father, we pray that we will never take it for granted, uh, the privilege to come and to meet with thee in this thy house. We thank thee that thou hast promised that thy presence will be here. And we ask tonight that as we gather uh, with uh, each other in this service, that we would renew that fellowship even with thyself. May we enter in to the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Father, we do thank thee for all that are gathered in. We bring all thy people before thee tonight. We pray for them all. We ask that thou would be pleased to meet all their needs. Pour in thy grace and each and every life. We pray that you'll uh, give help in every circumstance and every uh, stage of our Christian walk that we may be at. And we ask tonight that as we come to study thy word and as we come to study the great doctrines of Scripture that have been set forth uh, for us in the confession of faith. Oh, Father, we pray that we would learn something more of thee. We pray that you will draw us on that closer walk. We pray, O oh God, that not only would we grow in a head knowledge, but also in a heart knowledge of the things of God. Father, we think of those that can't be here. We think of those laid aside in sickness at this time. We pray for them. We pray that you'll lend that healing hand of God to them, touch them, and raise them again to health and strength. Be with the vulnerable. Be with those that are shielding. We pray for the bereaved as well tonight. We pray for all the families that have lost loved ones over the last number of weeks associated with the congregation here. And we think especially tonight of Derek and Jacqueline and Sonia and Elaine and Beverly. We do bring them before thee tonight at the throne of grace. We pray that you will comfort and pray for uh, their mother at this time as well, that you will give help uh, to her. We pray that uh, the presence of the Lord would draw near to that family. We pray that in the days that lie ahead as thy word is ministered to them, we pray that even those that may be outside of Christ or those that are cold in heart, may they even be drawn uh, to thyself. And we pray for those that are thy children, that you'll comfort and give grace and strength in these days. Father, we do thank you of our denomination. We thank thee for it. We thank thee for so many doors open for the preaching of thy word tonight. So many opportunities for thy people to come and to gather together. We thank thee that we're meeting in accordance to thy word. We thank thee that thou hast commanded us to come and to meet in such a fashion. And Father, we thank thee tonight for thy grace and thy mercy that finds us here. So continue with us. This evening, our we plead for it's in our Saviour's precious and holy name we ask. Amen. 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 We're turning in God's Word this evening to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. We're going to commence our reading at verse number 12. Isaiah chapter 40, and verse number 12. Isaiah 40 to verse 12. No stand as we read God's precious word this evening, please. Verse 12. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and made it out heaven with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance? Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, our being his counsellor, hath taught him? With whom took he counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him in the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed to him the way of understanding. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket, and are count counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. 
And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the base thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing, and vanity. To whom then will ye liken God, or what likeness will ye compare unto him? And then we'll end our reading there in the verse 18. You may be seated. We trust the Lord will bless his word to our hearts this evening. Tonight we want to continue our study again on the confession of faith, and we're moving to the next chapter of our study, and that chapter is entitled, Of God's Covenant with Man. Of God's Covenant with Man. And as are all the subjects that we deal with, all the subjects that are covered in this great confession of faith, this is a subject of great importance. It's necessary that we understand it as we come to Scripture and see how God actually deals with man, how God has a relationship with man. You see, God's dealings with us, God's dealings with the entire human race, they are done so in the framework of a covenant. And what is a covenant? Well, the concept of what is known as covenant theology runs right throughout the pages of Scripture. Dealing with the specifics of what a covenant is in the context of Scripture, we must understand that both the Old and New Testaments deal with this subject of the covenant. They deal with the uh, subject of God dealing with people in the framework of a, of a covenant. Of course, as you know, the original language of Scripture was not uh, English. We have a translation into English in our hands tonight. But the Old Testament, uh, the original language is Hebrew. The New Testament was Greek. And there's a Hebrew word and a Greek word that is used for this word covenant as we come uh, to study it in Scripture. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is a word called bereath. And that's what we have translated as covenant. And there are three main ways that we can view uh, this Hebrew word for covenant. Firstly, it comes from the word bara, which means to cut. To cut, and it refers there to the cutting of an animal in terms of a sacrifice. And really, it, it is translated the cutting of a covenant. And it signifies to us about the bloodshedding that was present, the bloodshedding that was necessary when a covenant was made. The words used in Genesis 15 and the verse 18, it says, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. And the word used there for covenant, it literally means to cut to cut a covenant. The Lord cut a covenant with Abraham. But secondly, the word is derived from another word called bara, which means to eat. And when we come to covenants in Scripture, they were often marked by a feast. They were often marked by food uh, being eaten. And then thirdly, it can come from the word barar, which means to purify ceremonially. And so that's the Hebrew use of the word covenant and it shows us here that it points to an agreement that cannot be broken an agreement that is sealed with blood now as we come to the new testament the greek word is the word diatheke and it speaks to us of the fact that god as the great administrator of the covenant between god and man he bestows spiritual blessings upon his people he undertakes in the covenant he's made with his people to bless them without fail. And so the biblical idea and the biblical concept of a covenant is this one of a binding agreement between God and between men. Now we want to think tonight firstly of the need of a covenant. We have established that this is how God deals with people. It runs right throughout scripture. But why does God need to deal with man in such Away. Well, the first statement of this next chapter of the Confession says this. That some of these might be a bit uh, small because they're quite uh, long uh, statements, but we'll read them out uh, anyway. But this statement, it says this. It says, The distance between God and the creature is so great that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience unto him as their creator, yet they could never have any fruition of him as their blessedness and reward, but by some voluntary, some voluntary condescension on God's part, 
which he has been pleased to express by way of covenant. In other words, in answer to the question, why is a covenant needed? It is needed because the distance between God and man is so great. It is so vast. So great is the gulf between the creature and the creator. And whilst the creature, that's us as the human race, whilst we owe our obedience to God, whilst we owe our worship to God, whilst that is our duty, our responsibility, yet we can never know God as our reward. We can never know him as our blessedness. We can never truly know him or have a relationship with him unless God came down to man and bridged that great gap that there is between God and man. And he does this by coming in the form of a covenant or an agreement between him and his people. We read those words tonight in Isaiah 40, and the portion that we read. And if you look there at verses 15 and 17, verse 15 says, Behold, the nations are as the drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. And then verse 17, All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. And you see, that is what we are when we compare ourselves to God. We are as dust. We are as a drop in the bucket. We are less than nothing. That is the great distance between God and man. So great is the difference between us and the great sovereign that this is how that we can view ourselves here in Isaiah chapter 40. You see, although we're made in the image of God, yet there's a great difference between God and man. There's differences in our very being. We could summarize it by thinking of our smallness, but God's greatness. And we can't even deal with it sufficiently in words so great and so much higher is God and his ways. As one commentator has said, God is not in need of us. He's not in need of us. We're in no position to give anything to God. And God as our creator is in no need of anything from us. Job 35, 7 says, If thou be righteous, what givest thou him? Or what receiveth he of thine hand? There's a great distance between God and and man. Therefore, what the confession is teaching us here that unless God came down to man, unless God made this condescension down to deal with man, the distance between God and man would be too great for us to ever have a relationship with him. It would be too great. And so God comes to man in his grace and in his mercy, and he has a relationship with man in the form of a covenant. And that's how we must understand that God deals with his people. It's always in the framework of a covenant. A divine and sovereign covenant between God and man. And so that is what the confession is dealing with here in the first statement. But having established that, we need to move on to consider the specifics of this covenant. What does scripture teach us about these covenants that God deals with man? Well, we must note firstly that there are two of them. That are mentioned in scripture. The first covenant that God used to deal with men. Was the covenant of works. And that covenant has now ceased. As we will see shortly. But the second is the covenant of grace. Well let's look firstly at this covenant of works. The next statement of the confession says this. The first covenant made with man was a covenant of works. Wherein life was promised to Adam. And in him to his posterity upon condition of perfect and personal obedience. The first covenant we have in scripture is the covenant of works. It was a covenant made between God and Adam. Sometimes it is called the Adamic covenant, of course, referring to Adam. But God had placed Adam in the Garden of Eden and he entered into a covenant with him. He entered into a covenant not only with Adam, but with his posterity, with the human race. And this covenant consisted of a promise from God. That promise was for uh, life for Adam and life for his prosperity, life for the human race. But there was a condition in that covenant that God placed upon man. And that's where the works come in. The condition was perfect and personal obedience to the will and to the law 
of God. What did this obedience require? Well, Genesis 2, 17, as we know, tells us this, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And if Adam had obeyed the requirements that God set out here, if he hadn't have eaten of that forbidden fruit, then Adam and his posterity would receive life. That was the promise of God. That was the blessing that Adam would have received in that covenant of works. Romans 10, 5 says, For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. The one who does what's required in the law would live by it. And God promised life upon the condition of Adam's obedience to God. It was as simple as that. Therefore, if Adam did not meet this condition, if he failed to keep the requirements that God placed upon him under this great covenant of works, then he would not receive life, but he would receive death. And we must understand the great tragedy of the fall of man. You see, it was very real, very possible for Adam to obey this command. And if he had done so, then Adam would have received abundant life. God would fulfill his requirement because he has to, because he's a just God, and death would never have entered in. And that's the tragedy of the fall. Because if Adam had have obeyed God's command, if Adam and Eve hadn't have taken of that forbidden fruit, if they had have fulfilled their responsibilities under that covenant of works, well then the fall never would have happened, sin wouldn't have entered in, and death wouldn't have come, but Adam would have received life. That was the covenant of works that we have in the Garden of Eden. The next statement in the confession says this. says, man by his fall, having made himself incapable of life by that covenant, the Lord was pleased to make a second, commonly called the covenant of grace, wherein he freely offers unto sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ, requiring of them faith in him that they may be saved, and promising to give unto all those who are ordained unto eternal life his Holy Spirit to make them willing and able to believe. And of course, as we consider in the covenant of works, man failed. He fell into sin, as we thought even over the last number of weeks. He failed to meet his requirements in that covenant. And because of that, Adam and the entire human race is in a state of total depravity, incapable of obtaining eternal life, incapable of obeying now the law of God because of the sin that is in his heart and in his soul. And of course, we know that that's the state that we all find ourselves in. We're incapable of perfect obedience to the law of God. It is commanded, this is what we must do, but we're incapable of it because of the great depravity that we've been plunged into because of our sin. And as God had said, of course, the breaking of that law is death, and therefore we all must die. We all must be punished. But notice what the confession says. It says, The Lord was pleased to make a second, commonly called the covenant of grace. You see, God would have been perfectly just in leaving man in this sinful state, just letting him reap the punishment that he had earned because of his sin. Man had broken this covenant and therefore he had to pay the price and God could have just justly and righteously left him in the sinful state. Man had an opportunity, a great opportunity to obey the law of God, to obtain abundant life, but he failed, he sinned against God. But we thank God tonight that God did not leave man without hope. We learn here that by his grace God made a second covenant. A covenant whereby man could obtain life. See, knowing that man could not fulfill this first covenant of works, God made a second. And we must say, of course, Adam could have, before the fall, have fulfilled that requirement of the covenant, of that covenant. But because of the fall, we can't. So God created this covenant of grace. And it's through this covenant of grace that men and women and young people are saved from their sin. And so let us consider this covenant of grace. God entered into this covenant with Christ and with his chosen people. That's who's involved in this covenant. It's the Godhead.
Christ and the elect people of God. There are two aspects to the covenant. Firstly, there's a redemptive or a redeeming aspect. This part of the covenant was made between God the Father, God the Son, and us as the people of God. And in this aspect of the covenant, the Lord Jesus Christ made a promise. He made a promise to render perfect obedience to the law of God, to that covenant of works, that covenant that we can no longer fulfill. Christ promised to fulfill it on behalf of his people. And then he promised to redeem them by giving his life a ransom for them. So not only would he fulfill the law of God, but he would take the punishment for breaking the law of God that should have fallen upon us. That was a promise that was made between Christ and God, uh, God the Son and God the Father. But secondly, there's a grace aspect. And in this aspect, God the Father promised that upon the obedience of God the Son, upon the obedience of his rendering perfect obedience to the law and his giving his life as a ransom, if Christ was to do that and to fulfill his promise, well then God would bestow all these blessings upon the elect, including life, eternal life. In other words, God promised that upon Christ's obedience to the law, his sacrifice for sin, God would give his people the gifts of faith and repentance, the ability to be able, uh, by the irresistible grace of God, to accept him as their own and personal saviour. We find references to this great promise in the covenant of grace many places in Scripture. The very first one recorded is Genesis 3 in the verse 15. It says there, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And that is the very first uh, promise that we have in relation to this covenant of grace. Further reference is made in Isaiah 42. Just turn over a couple of pages there uh, from our reading to Isaiah 42 and the verse number 6. It says there, I the Lord have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. And here the Messiah, he was promised in this covenant. The Messiah, God's own son, was to come in the framework of this covenant to seek and to save the lost. Man could not fulfill the law because of the fall, so God sent his son to fulfill it for them. Romans 8, 3 to 4 says, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And so, in this covenant of grace, Christ fulfills the law of God, something we cannot do anymore because of our sin. Christ does it for his people. And in return for that in the covenant, God, he saves his elect people through that sacrifice and through the laying down of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. It's the covenant of grace. One commentator has said this, in this gospel we find a righteousness which is based on faith in Christ. And as we believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, it is by this we are saved. We live by faith, which is to confess that we actually live by the power and grace of Christ and not by ourselves. You see, this covenant of grace, it focuses on the Lord Jesus Christ. God displays his grace. He displays his mercy through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is where we receive our assurance tonight dear child of God because as God's people we're in this covenant of grace we're in this agreement that is bound and sealed by the precious blood of the covenant the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ there's no safer place for us to be Christ has perfectly fulfilled his requirements and therefore God must fulfill his and save his people that's the binding of the, the covenant that he's made and that brings us great assurance that brings us assurance of our salvation this is evidence alone that God's people cannot be lost this covenant cannot be broken God cannot break his covenant it is sealed 
by the precious blood of his son that was shed on Calvary. And therefore we have assurance of our salvation. If we're a true born again child of God purchased by the blood of Christ. Well then we're in this covenant of grace that is sealed with Christ's blood. And we cannot be lost. The covenant cannot be broken. And that's your assurance and your hope tonight dear child of God. That's something we need to rest upon. That is why it's important that although maybe when we come to subjects like this it can seem heavy and deep but once we get a grasp of it even in some small way what joy it brings the child of God because we're in this covenant and we're sealed with Christ's blood and we cannot be lost. And it's a thrill to be able to see that this is how God deals with his people because we're bound there within this covenant. We're saved for all eternity. As part of this covenant of grace, God also promises to give his Holy Spirit to his people. The end of this third statement says this, and promising to give unto all those that are ordained unto eternal life his Holy Spirit to make them willing and able to believe. And what this shows us is the very faith that we need to believe in Christ that has been provided to us by God in the covenant of grace. We cannot believe on our own we can't believe in our own fallen state, but the very faith and repentance that we need it has been purchased by Christ as he laid down his life there in Calvary. That is what it means to be saved by grace alone. It's all of grace. It is nothing of man. Yes, there's a responsibility on man to respond to the gospel. Of course there is. That doesn't take away from that at all. But all we need to believe has been purchased by Christ. At Calvary. And that's the great joy of this covenant of grace. And moving on to the next statement, statement four, it says this This covenant of grace is frequently set forth in Scripture by the name of a testament in reference to the death of Jesus Christ, the testator, and to the everlasting inheritance with all things belonging to it therein bequeathed. Essentially, what this statement is saying is that the covenant of grace in Scripture it is also called a testament. And so we should be aware that as we read through Scripture, we might see that word testament. For example, Hebrews 9, 15 says, And for this cause he's the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And speaking there of Christ being the mediator of of what it says there as being the New Testament. It's talking about the new covenant, the covenant of grace. Christ is the mediator of that. And of course, we can think of the legal language here. We think of a last will and testament that perhaps we make and ought to make in our lives. In such a testament, somebody inherits something upon the death of another. And in a certain extent here, it's clear for us to see that in the use of this language, we can see the gospel. We can view the gospel in this type of terminology. One commentator has said this, For we all know who must die before a last will and testament comes into effect. It's the one who made it. And so it is that the Son of God bled out his life for us so that we would receive an everlasting inheritance. And so that's a, a, another idea that this word testament gives us. About upon the death of another, of course, in the gospel, it's the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's people receive an eternal inheritance. And that's the great theme of the covenant of grace. We must move on to the last two statements of this chapter. We would deal with them very briefly, uh, but we'd just like to cover this whole uh, chapter this evening. But the next statement says this. This covenant was differently administered in the time of the law than in the time of the gospel. Under the law, it was administered by promises, prophecies, sacrifices, circumcision, the paschal lamb, and other types and ordinances delivered to the people of the Jews, all for signifying Christ to come, which were for that time sufficient and efficacious through the operation of the Spirit to instruct and build up the elect in faith in the promised Messiah, by whom they had full remission of sins and eternal salvation and his call the Old Testament. I want to draw your attention to the first line of that statement. It says, This covenant was differently administered in the time of the law 
and in the time of the gospel. What does it mean? Well, this covenant is speaking of the covenant of grace that we've been dealing with. And it's saying here, essentially, that in the Old Testament, when we read of God dealing with the Jews, dealing with the nation of Israel, this covenant of grace was administered in a different way than what it is to the New Testament church. But the whole point that we're to grasp here was it's the same covenant. It's not a different covenant. It's not a matter of fact that that God's people in the Old Testament got saved in a different way than we do. That's not the case at all. It's just that it was administered differently, as we will see in a minute. But the saints of the Old Testament, they were saved by faith in Christ through grace from God, just in the same way that we are in the New Testament right up until this point in time. The Old Testament saints look forward in faith to the sacrifice of Christ. We look back in faith, but it's the same faith. It's the same grace given by God. It's just administered uh, differently. Look firstly at the administration of the Old Testament. Reminds us there in the confession that the Holy Spirit communicated the message of the gospel in the Old Testament through promises, prophecies, sacrifices, circumcision, uh, the Paschal Lamb, and other different types of uh, ordinances and, and pictures. And none of these things were complete in themselves. They could never save God's people in and of themselves. But they all served a purpose in pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ who was to come to seek and to save the lost. It was pointing to that promised Messiah that was to come to lay down his life for for his people. That's what all these things in the Old Testament point towards. That's what circumcision pointed towards. That's what all the ceremonies and sacrifices point towards. That's what the likes of the Passover pointed towards. They were all things that were a foresignifying of Christ to come. And they were used by the Holy Ghost to communicate this great gospel of grace to God's people of old. And they were sufficient and efficacious. They were efficacious, that means, in this context that through the working of the Holy Spirit, they were successful in bringing people to faith in Christ. That is what the Holy Spirit used. Christ said of Abraham in John 8, Verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. He saw it in types and pictures in the Old Testament. Think of the great account of Abraham being asked to sacrifice Isaac on the altar. There was a great picture of Christ. There was a great pointing to the Savior that was to come and the Lord used it to teach and to instruct Abraham. The point is the Old Testament saints just like we do required faith in Christ in order to be saved. Just the same as we do today. It was just administered here in a different way, but it's the same covenant. You see, there's a false view that goes about today, and it's quite a predominant view. And we need to be careful about such thinking because it's the false view that in the Old Testament the saints of God were saved differently than we are today, and it wasn't by grace. And it wasn't by faith. But that's not true at all. All who are saved, whether it's past, whether it's present, whether it's saints that are yet to be saved, we're all saved in the same way. We're all in this covenant of grace. It is all through faith in Christ and by the grace of God alone. There's no different ways of salvation throughout the ages. It's the one covenant of grace. As we said before, those Old Testament saints, they look forward to Christ. We look back to what Christ has done. And that's essentially it. It Put as simply as we can. But what about then the New Testament? And with this we'll close this evening. The next statement says this. Under the gospel, when Christ the substance was exhibited, the ordinances in which this covenant is dispensed are the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, which though fewer in number and administered with more simplicity and less outward glory in them, it is held forth in more fullness, evidence, and spiritual efficacy to all nations, both Jews and Gentiles, and is called the New Testament. There are not therefore two covenants of grace, differing in substance, but one and the same under various dispensations. In other words, in the New Testament, in the new administration of the covenant, of grace, The Holy Spirit doesn't use those types and symbols of the Old Testament. That is why 
that there's no sacrifices anymore. That's why there's no circumcision uh, needed anymore. That's why uh, all those types and ceremonies of the Old Testament uh, are, are gone because they have been replaced in this new administration of the covenant by what? By the preaching of the word of God, by baptism, by the Lord's Supper. It is these things that the Holy Spirit now uses. They are less in number than all the things of the Old Testament, but in them, the confession tells us that there's more fullness, more evidence, more spiritual efficacy to all nations, both Jew and Gentiles. Remember the old administration was for the Jews. But it was only when Christ came, the gospel was opened up to both Jews and Gentiles. You can read all about that in the gospels, in the New Testament. And it is through the means of the preaching of the word of God that the Holy Spirit today uses uh, to draw men and women to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is through baptism, it is through the Lord's Supper that the Holy Spirit points us to the Lord Jesus Christ, even as his people. All these things focus on Christ the Saviour. We preach Christ. We remember Christ as we come to the Lord's Supper. We are baptised in the name of Christ, along with the name of God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And what a privilege we have today of having these things. What a privilege we have of having the Word of God, of having the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, which point us to the grace and the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, as the confession states, there are not two covenants of grace, but the one, but just administered under two different ways, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The whole gospel message that is contained in the word of God, God's dealing with men, whether it's from uh, the perspective of man or whether it's regarding the sending of Christ to be a saviour of his people, it's all to be viewed in the framework of this glorious covenant of grace. That's how God deals with his people. That's how God has dealt with us tonight. We are found in this great covenant of grace, whereby Christ has fulfilled the requirements for us. Not only has he obeyed the law, but he's taken the punishment for breaking that law. And in return for that, God has promised to save his people from their sin. It's a covenant that cannot be broken. Covenant that God will never break. It is sealed, as we've said before, to the blood of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the importance of this subject. It's important that we understand this is how God deals with it. And though perhaps we've taken a little longer to go through it tonight, it is important. And I trust that it will be a joy to your heart and soul to realise that this is how God deals with us. And the great assurance and joy that it brings us even tonight as the people of God. I trust the Lord will bless his word to our hearts tonight for his own name's sake. I will sing another hymn before we come to our time of prayer. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. Rule men say that again as we sing after the introduction, please. <laughs> trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of his resurrection share when 
his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies. And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder. From the dawn till setting sun, let me talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then, when all of life is over and my work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. I do remember, as we come to prayer, the services on the Lord's Day at the regular times, half eleven, and 7 p.m. Remember the times of prayer before uh, those services as well. Pray that the Lord will come and visit us here as we meet in his house. Uh, do remember the retiring offering uh, at the door as well, please. And also as you leave at the door on the table, there are the accounts for uh, the work here in Dunmurray for last year, 2019. Uh, breaking, breakdown of all the accounts uh, are the details of the accounts for last year, so they're free to take. Uh, and just also in relation uh, to the children's work uh, as well, uh, obviously things are very difficult at this time. There's a lot of restrictions and a lot of different things that uh, are hindering uh, all the services being up and running. And uh, of course we want to see things getting back to normal, but we're not just quite at that stage uh, just yet. But uh, we have uh, taken the decision, the session, to aim to try, if things are okay uh, in the current climate, to uh, recommence our Sunday school, uh, perhaps sometime at the beginning of October. It's not set in stone. We're going to continue to uh, see how things go over the next couple of weeks. If things uh, decline, uh, especially in schools and amongst children, we then uh, will not recommence it. But if things in a couple of weeks' time uh, seem not too bad, well then we'll uh, approach the parents firstly and we'll see if they're willing to send their children along and we'll take it from there. But just so the congregation knows uh, that uh, we are thinking about these things, we are doing what we can uh, to get everything up and running, but uh, as you can appreciate, it's difficult at this time. And to this end, in relation to uh, our fellowship meetings, we've taken the decision that it'll probably be next year uh, before these will be up and running. Uh, again, unless things drastically change, of course, uh, at the end of this year. And we know the Lord can intervene, and we pray to that end that the Lord will intervene, and that this virus will be dealt with, that it will disappear uh, by the help of the Lord from the land, and that all the fear and all the restrictions and everything would uh, be removed, and that we'd be able to uh, work freely again. And that is our prayer, that's what we want. Uh, but obviously, in the meantime, we have to work to the restrictions that are before us. So do remember all these things and all the aspects of the work in this regard, please. Continue to pray as we come down to your time of prayer for our two new families, for the congregation here. Pray for the sick. Then you remember John and Gladys Speedy. Then you remember Ella Walker now. She's in uh, a home. Remember Robin, Robin Cahoon, Maureen uh, Cargan. Uh, continue to remember Roberta Hoy. She was due to get into a home uh, this week. I'm not sure yet if that's happened um, or not, but continue to remember uh, her, please. Continue to pray for the bereaved of the congregation. Continue to pray for uh, Robin and Pearl and, of course, uh, Jacqueline, Derek and the, all the sisters and all that family circle uh, there at this time as well. 